Mental illness, then, is fundamentally psychoepistemological. A mental disorder is a thinking disorder. This is fairly obvious in cases where the patient's predominant symptoms are hallucinations, delusions, time-space disorientations, and so on. But it is equally true in cases where the patient's symptoms are less obviously cognitive in origin. This includes such things as pathological anxiety, depression, hypogondriasis, conversion reactions, or sadomasochism. Neurotic and psychotic manifestations, such as inappropriate emotional responses or aberrant behavior, are the symptoms and consequences of a mind's malfunctioning. But the root problem is always the mind's alienation from reality in some form to a greater or lesser extent. Consider, for example, a case of pathological depression. A secretary is asked by her employer to make certain that she finishes some office reports by the end of the day. She hears this request as a declaration of her incompetence and worthlessness, and she collapses in acute depression. It is misleading to say that she suffers from an emotional disorder. She suffers from a psychoepistemological disorder. Her problem lies in the mental processes by which she interprets the things she perceives and hears. Her problem lies in the mental processes generating her emotions. Once such disturbed emotions are generated, they tend to have a negative effect on the person's thinking, which then leads to further disturbed emotions and so on. This is one of the ways in which harmful psychoepistemological policies are self-reinforcing and self-perpetuating. But disturbed emotions do not create the initial problem. The initial problem creates the disturbed emotions. The same principle applies to behavior. If a man is dishonest, parasitical, and exploitative in his human relations, it is not his behavior that constitutes his mental illness, but the psychoepistemological policies behind his behavior. It should be noted that mental illness is not indicated by a man's momentary loss of cognitive contact with reality, such as might occur under the impact of a violent emotion. Mental illness implies the presence of enduring obstructions to a mind's cognitive efficacy. Mental illness implies the presence of automatized or partially automatized obstructions to conceptual integration, which in simpler language means to clear awareness. Mental health is unobstructed cognitive efficacy. Unobstructed cognitive efficacy requires and entails intellectual independence. A doctrine that is subversive of intellectual independence is subversive of mental health. Now, closely related to the concept of mental health is that of psychological maturity. Maturity, in the broadest sense, is the state of being fully grown or developed. A living organism is mature when its normal process of development is completed and it functions on the adult level appropriate to its species. Psychological maturity, then, is a concept pertaining to the successful development of man's consciousness. At first, a child knows only perceptual concretes. He does not know abstractions or principles. His world is only the immediate now. He cannot think, plan, or act long range. As the child grows, his intellectual field widens. He learns language, he begins to grasp abstractions, he generalizes, he makes increasingly subtle discriminations, he looks for principles. He rises from the sensory perceptual level of consciousness to the conceptual level. The basic index of successfully achieved adulthood is the policy of conceptualizing. All other aspects of psychological maturity are derivatives and consequences of developing one's conceptual faculty. There is an aspect of psychological maturity that is profoundly important and that few adults fully achieve. It pertains to one's attitude toward the unknown, not toward knowledge which has not yet been discovered by anyone, but toward knowledge which is available but which one does not possess. To a child, the world around him is an immense unknown. He is aware that adults possess knowledge far in excess of his own, and that there are many things he is not yet able to understand. He tells himself, in effect, I will have to wait until I grow up. There are many things I cannot understand now. They are known to other people, but they are beyond me at present. 
This is not the attitude of a genuinely mature adult. An adult, too, of course, may recognize that there are things he does not yet know and needs to learn. But he does not entertain such a category as that which is known to others, but unknowable to him, meaning unknowable in principle. This does not mean that his goal is to possess encyclopedic knowledge. It means rather that within the sphere of his first-hand concerns, of his own actions and goals, he regards himself as competent to know that which he needs to know, and to acquire whatever knowledge his interests and purposes demand. It means that he does not resign himself to the permanently unknown, when and if the knowledge is available and is relevant to his activities. It means that he does not regard himself as a second-class citizen psychoepistemologically. It is this attitude, consistently maintained, that marks a man's entry into full adulthood, that is, into full self-responsibility. There is no value judgment more important to man no factor more decisive in his psychological development and motivation than the estimate he passes on himself. This estimate is ordinarily experienced by him not in the form of a conscious, verbalized judgment, but in the form of a feeling that can be hired to isolate and identify because he experiences it constantly. It is part of every other feeling, it is involved in his every emotional response. The nature of his self-evaluation has profound effects on a man's thinking processes, emotions, desires, values, and goals. It is the single most significant key to his behavior. To understand a man psychologically, one must understand the nature and degree of his self-esteem and the standards by which he judges himself. Man experiences his desire for self-esteem as an urgent imperative, as a basic need. Whether he identifies the issue explicitly or not, he cannot escape the feeling that his estimate of himself is of life and death importance. At three o'clock in the morning, at some level, that is a fact we are all aware of. So intensely does a man feel the need of a positive view of himself that he may evade, repress, distort his judgment, disintegrate his mind. This in order to avoid coming face to face with facts that would affect his self-appraisal adversely. A man who has chosen or accepted irrational standards by which to judge himself can be driven all his life to pursue flagrantly self-destructive goals. This in order to assure himself that he possesses a self-esteem which in fact he does not have. If, and to the extent, that men lack self-esteem, they feel driven to fake it, to create the illusion of self-esteem. Thus they condemn themselves to chronic psychological fraud. Self-esteem has two interrelated aspects or components. It entails a sense of personal efficacy and a sense of personal worth. It is the integrated sum of self-confidence and self-respect. It is the conviction that one is competent to live and worthy of living. Man's need of self-esteem is inherent in his nature, but he is not born with the knowledge of what will satisfy that need or of the standard by which self-esteem is to be gauged. He must discover it. Here is where our earlier discussion of needs becomes relevant. Why does man need self-esteem? How does it relate to his survival? What are the conditions of its attainment? What is the cause of its profound motivational power? These are the questions we must consider. There are two facts about man's nature which hold the key to the answer. The first is the fact that reason is man's basic means of survival. The second is the fact that the exercise of his rational faculty is volitional. Most men do not identify the role and importance of reason in their lives, but from the time that the child acquires the capacity of conceptual functioning, he becomes increasingly aware, implicitly and subverbally, of his responsibility for regulating his mind's activity. He acquires the ability to discriminate between the state of mental focus and the state of mental fog, and to choose one state 
or the other. Now, let us consider the relevance of these facts to man's need of self-esteem. Since man must choose his goals and actions, his life and happiness require that he be right, right in the conclusions he draws and the choices he makes. But he cannot demand or expect omniscience or infallibility. What he needs is the conviction that his method of choosing and of making decisions, his characteristic manner of using his consciousness, is right in principle, appropriate to reality. Man is the only living species able to reject, sabotage, and betray his own means of survival, his mind. He is the only living species who must make himself competent to live by the proper exercise of his rational faculty. How a man chooses to deal with this issue is, psychologically, the most significant fact about him, because it lies at the very core of his being as a biological entity. To the extent that a man is committed to cognition, to the extent that the primary goal regulating the functioning of his consciousness is awareness, the mental operations activated by his choice lead in the direction of cognitive efficacy. To the extent that he fails or refuses to make awareness the regulating goal of his consciousness, to the extent that he evades the effort of thought and the responsibility of reason, the result is cognitive inefficacy. To think or not to think, to focus his mind or to suspend it, is man's basic act of choice, the one act directly within his volitional power. To the extent that man characteristically makes the right choices, he experiences a sense of control over his existence, the control of a mind in proper relationship to reality. Self-confidence is confidence in one's mind in its reliability as a tool of cognition. Such confidence is not the conviction that one can never make an error. This point must be emphasized. Rather, it is the conviction that one is competent to think, to judge, to know, that one is competent in principle. It is the conviction that one is committed to being in unbreached contact with reality to the fullest extent of one's power. It is the confidence of knowing that one places no value or consideration higher than reality. This basic type of confidence must be distinguished from other more superficial types of self-confidence, which reflect a person's sense of efficacy at particular tasks or in particular areas. This basic self-confidence is not a judgment passed on one's knowledge or special skills. It is a judgment passed on that which acquires knowledge and skills. It is psychoepistemological self-confidence. It is a judgment passed on one's characteristic manner of facing and dealing with the facts of reality. Man needs such self-confidence because to doubt the efficacy of his tool of survival is to be stopped, paralyzed, condemned to anxiety and helplessness, and to some extent rendered unfit to live. Very early in his development, as a child becomes aware of his power to choose his actions, as he acquires the sense of being a person, he experiences the need to feel that he is right as a person, right in his characteristic manner of acting. He needs to feel that he is good. He is not aware of the question in relation to the issue of life or death. He is aware of it only in relation to the alternative of joy or suffering. To be right as a person is to be fit for happiness. To be wrong is to be threatened by pain. As I have stressed, no other living species faces such questions as, what kind of entity should I seek to become? By what moral principles should I guide my life? But there is no way for a man to escape these questions. Man cannot exempt himself from the realm of values and value judgments. Whether the values by which he judges himself are conscious or subconscious, rational or irrational, consistent or contradictory, life-serving or life-negating, every human being judges himself by some standard. And to the extent that he fails to satisfy that standard, his sense of personal worth, his self-respect, suffers accordingly. Man needs self-respect 
because he has to act to achieve values. And in order to act, he needs to value the beneficiary of his action. In order to seek values, man must consider himself worthy of enjoying them. In order to fight for his happiness, he must consider himself worthy of happiness. The two aspects of self-esteem, self-confidence, and self-respect can be isolated conceptually, but they are inseparable in a man's psychology. Man makes himself worthy of living by making himself competent to live, by dedicating his mind to the task of discovering what is true and what is right, and by governing his actions accordingly. If a man defaults on the responsibility of thought and reason, thus undercutting his competence to live, he will not retain his sense of worthiness. If he betrays his moral convictions, thus undercutting his sense of worthiness, he will not retain his sense of competence. The root of both aspects of self-esteem is psychoepistemological. Such, in briefest essence, are the nature and causes of man's need of self-esteem. If man is to achieve and maintain self-esteem, the first and fundamental requirement is that he preserve an indomitable will to understand. The desire for comprehension of that which falls within the range of his awareness is the guardian of man's mental health and the motor of his intellectual growth. The potential range of a man's awareness depends on the extent of his intelligence, but the principle of the will to understand remains the same on all levels of intelligence. It requires the identification and integration to the best of a man's knowledge and ability of that which comes into his mental field. Unfortunately, this attitude is usually relinquished or breached very early in a person's life. Then the person adjusts to the sense of living in an unintelligible, bewildering, and frightening universe in which cognitive self-confidence is impossible. Sometimes the cause is a volitional default on the part of the child, an attitude of irresponsible passivity and dependence. Sometimes the cause is the child's desire to indulge in wishes or actions he knows to be irrational, which requires that a policy of evasion be instituted, which requires that the will to understand be suspended. However, often the causes are much more complex. Take, for instance, the case of a child who comes up against human irrationality with which he does not know how to cope. A child may find the world around him, the world of his parents and other adults, incomprehensible and threatening. Many of the actions, emotions, ideas, expectations, and demands of the adults appear senseless, contradictory, oppressive, and bewilderingly inimical to him. After a number of unsuccessful attempts to understand their policies and behavior, the child gives up, and, here is the tragedy, takes the blame for his feeling of helplessness. He may react with anger or hostility or anxiety or depression or withdrawal, but, consciously or subconsciously, he takes his failure to understand as a reflection on himself. He concludes that there is something wrong with him, that he is intellectually or morally deficient in some nameless way. Gradually, he gives up the expectation that he will ever be able to make sense of the world around him. He resigns himself to living with the permanently unknowable. A child is vulnerable because he is not yet able to recognize clearly and unequivocally that his elders are irrational. He cannot grasp their motives. He knows they know more than he does, but he senses that there is something terribly wrong with them or with himself or with something. What he feels is, I'll never understand people, I'll never be able to do what they expect of me, I don't know what's right or wrong, and I'm never going to know. So long as a child continues to struggle, so long as he does not give up the will to understand, he is psychologically safe, no matter what his anguish or bewilderment. Because in that case, he keeps his mind and his desire for efficacy intact. When he surrenders the expectation of achieving efficacy, he surrenders the possibility of achieving full self-esteem. Every child realizes that there are things he cannot expect to know until he grows older. That is not his problem. The problem lies in the things he feels he will never know, yet needs to know, if he is to function successfully.
This makes him regard himself, in effect, as an outcast in that foreign land called reality. Man controls his mind's activity and growth by the goals he sets, in effect, by the assignments he gives to his consciousness. If he holds to the will to understand, he thereby activates a process of growth and development which continually raises his mind's power. If he abandons the will to understand, his mind reacts accordingly. It does not continue to rise to higher levels of cognitive efficiency. This, then, is the basic condition necessary for the achievement of self-esteem, the preservation of the will to understand in every aspect of one's life. Now let us consider another condition necessary for the achievement of self-esteem. In the course of a human being's development, he encounters a problem which, according to how he chooses to deal with it, has profound repercussions on his self-esteem. First encountered in childhood, it is a problem that every person faces on some occasions in his life. There are times when a man's mind and emotions are not perfectly synchronized. He experiences desires or fears that clash with his rational understanding, and he must choose to follow either his rational understanding or his emotions. One of the most important things a child must learn is that emotions are not adequate guides to action. The fact that he desires to perform some action is not proof that he should perform it. The fact that he fears to perform some action is not proof that he should avoid performing it. Emotions are not tools of cognition nor criteria of judgment. The ability to distinguish between knowledge and feelings is an essential element in the process of a mind's healthy maturation. It is vital for the achievement and preservation of self-esteem. Self-esteem requires and entails what I call cognitive self-assertiveness, which is expressed through the policy of thinking, judging, and governing action accordingly. To sacrifice one's mind in favor of feelings one cannot justify or defend is to subvert one's self-esteem. If a man permits himself to be carried along passively by feelings he does not judge, he loses the sense of control over his existence that is essential to self-esteem. A child at first is not aware of such a dichotomy as valid desires versus invalid desires. He comes to learn from his experiences and from the teachings of his parents that some of the things he desires are good for him and others are not. Later he learns another subtler distinction. He is entitled to some of the things that he desires, but not to others. Thus, he comes to learn that the validity of his desires must be judged. Consider the case of a child who is tempted to steal the toy of a friend. He hesitates because he knows that he has no right to the toy, and that he would be indignant if his friend were to steal one of his toys. But he wants this particular toy, so he evades his knowledge and commits the theft. Within a few months he forgets about the incident, but its consequences are not ended. Wordlessly registered in his mind is the principle that it is permissible at times to ignore knowledge and facts in order to indulge a desire. This is the legacy of his theft. This, plus a residue of vague, nameless guilt, the sense of some inner uncleanliness, the state of a mind learning to distrust itself. He is free subsequently to repudiate this principle consciously and expunge it from his psychology. But if he fails to do so, if instead he reinforces it by repeated acts of evasion and irrational emotional indulgence, he undermines his self-esteem still further. How badly his self-esteem is damaged will depend on the frequency of his evasions, the extent of the knowledge he evades, and the nature of the desires he indulges. Some offenses are clearly more serious than others. If a person develops healthily, mind and emotions tend to achieve harmony. He is not chronically torn by conflicts between his desires and his knowledge. But no matter how well integrated a person may be, the process of holding and integrating the full long-range context of his knowledge is not automatic or infallible. Thus a man always has the responsibility of monitoring and appraising his desires. The majority of men as adults suffer from a significant deficit of self-esteem. The senseless tragedy of their lives is that most of them betrayed their mind 
not for the sake of gratifying some violent, if irrational, passion, but for the sake of indulging meaningless or senseless whims that they can no longer remember. They betrayed their minds for the sake of being free to act on the impulse or spur of the moment without the responsibility of awareness or thought. They betrayed their minds more often than not over trivia. If it is psychologically disastrous to reject one's mind under the pressure of irrational desires, there is another practice which is perhaps more disastrous still, and that is rejecting one's mind under the pressure of fear. The sacrifice of one's mind to fear is a form of self-abnegation. Now, of course, the experience of fear per se is not abnormal or pathological. In many instances, fear has a definite value. It can activate man to cope with some danger. What is crucial for man's psychological well-being is his attitude toward fear, his method of dealing with it. For instance, it is very common for young children to have the experience of being frightened by a barking dog, but children can react to this experience in different ways. One child may be careful to avoid the dog as a practical precautionary measure. Later, he may learn that the dog is not harmful but playful and may make himself approach the dog and pat him until all fear is gone. Another child may avoid the dog after the first encounter, but continue to whimper and whine whenever he sees or hears the dog, even at a great distance. No amount of evidence that the dog is friendly alters his attitude. The difference in their reactions reflects the different attitudes they adopt toward their fear. The first child, even though afraid, remains in cognitive control. He does not permit the fear to overwhelm his consciousness. Consequently, he does not regard the fear and his avoidance of the dog as a reflection on himself or on his personal worth. He is able to grasp, when the evidence presents itself, that the dog is not in fact a danger to him and his policy toward the dog changes accordingly. But the second child, overwhelmed by fear, his self-awareness is reduced to a sense of all-encompassing helplessness. Nothing is real to him, nothing matters, except that he is afraid. That is why his mind is not open to evidence that could change his policy toward the dog. In the life of a young child, a certain amount of fear is to be expected. Normally and healthily, with the growth of his knowledge and abilities, these fears are overcome and left behind, so that, with the transition to adulthood, fewer and fewer things have the power to invoke fear in him. The extent to which a child follows this course to full maturity depends on the policy he adopts for dealing with his fears. If, in such situations, a child struggles to preserve the clarity of his mind, he will find, as he grows older, that his susceptibility to fear diminishes radically. If, however, he characteristically surrenders to fear, then fear gains a greater and greater power over him, and each subsequent surrender feels more and more inevitable. His sense of personal efficacy is affected accordingly. The same principle applies on an adult level. For example, a man may remain silent and passively unprotesting when things which he values are being attacked through fear of not belonging or not being accepted. Or a man may retreat from the challenges of life and bury himself in the safety of the familiar through fear of failure or of making mistakes. Or a woman may repress her desire for a career through a fear of being considered unfeminine. In all, the result is a profound sense of humiliation, of self-abasement, of self-renunciation, which means a profound loss of self-esteem. Sometimes, of course, a fear experience can be so intense that the capacity for thought is momentarily wiped out. But such panic reactions pertain to short-term emergency situations and are, by their very nature, short-lived. In such cases, a person's attitude and policy toward fear is manifested through what he does when the panic dies down. Does he then proceed to think about the experience, to assimilate it, and to prepare himself for future similar situations? In other words, does he seek to reassert mastery and control over his life? Or does he merely shudder at the memory of the fear, struggle to evade the issue, and hope he will not encounter such problems again, resigning himself to a feeling of helplessness? The policy a man adopts in dealing with fear depends on whether he preserves what I call the will to efficacy.
It depends on whether he preserves the value of self-confidence as a goal not to be relinquished, and consequently regards a state of fear as temporary and abnormal and as that which he must overcome. Or does he resign himself to a sense of impotence and accept fear as a basic, unalterable given of his existence, to be endured, not defeated? Just as the will to understand requires that man never resign himself to accepting the unknowable as an inherent part of his life, so the will to efficacy requires that he never resign himself to living with uncontested fear. It must be stressed that the concept of surrender to fear pertains to a psychoepistemological process. That process is the subversion of one's consciousness in order to avoid or minimize a fear experience. This practice is entirely different from the rational avoidance of real dangers. In fact, opposite principles are at work in these two cases. In the first case, one is fleeing from reality. In the second, one is taking proper cognizance of it. The policies by which a man determines the state of his self-esteem are formed gradually across time. They are not the product of the choices of a single moment or issue. The collapse of self-esteem is not reached in a day, a week, or a month. It is the cumulative result of a long succession of defaults, evasions, and irrationalities, a long succession of failures to use one's mind properly. Self-esteem or the lack of it is the reputation a man acquires with himself. In the process of his psychological growth and development, a human being creates his own character. He does not do so self-consciously or by explicit intention. He does so by means of the volitional choices he makes day by day. A child does not commit himself to the will to understand in explicit terms. But in issue after issue that falls within the range of his awareness, he strives to achieve the fullest clarity and intelligibility possible to him, and thus he acquires a mental habit, a policy of dealing with reality, which can be identified conceptually as the will to understand. It is a policy that he must reaffirm volitionally in each new issue he encounters for as long as he lives. It always remains a matter of choice. The choices a human being makes with regard to the operation of his consciousness do not vanish leaving no trace behind them. These choices have long-term psychological consequences. The way a man chooses to deal with reality registers in his mind for good or for bad. Either it confirms and strengthens his self-esteem, or it undermines and depletes it. The concept of self-esteem must be distinguished from the concept of pride. The two are related, but there are significant differences in their meaning. Self-esteem pertains to a man's conviction of his fundamental efficacy and worth. Pride pertains to the pleasure a man takes in himself on the basis of, and in response to, specific achievements or actions. Self-esteem is confidence in one's capacity to achieve values. Pride is the consequence of having achieved some particular value or values. Self-esteem is, I can. Pride is, I have. The deepest pride a man can experience is that which results from his achievement of self-esteem. Since self-esteem is a value that has to be earned, the man who does so feels proud of his attainment. If, in spite of his best efforts, a man fails in a particular undertaking, he does not experience the same emotion of pride that he would feel if he had succeeded. But, if he is rational, his self-esteem is unaffected and unimpaired. His self-esteem is not, or should not be, dependent on particular successes or failures, since these are not necessarily in a man's direct or exclusive control. The failure to understand this principle causes an incalculable amount of unnecessary anguish and self-doubt. If a man judges himself by criteria that entail factors outside his control, the result is a precarious self-esteem that is in chronic jeopardy. For example, a man may find himself in a situation where it would be highly desirable for him to possess certain knowledge, but he does not possess it. This is not because of evasion or irresponsibility, but because he had seen no reason to acquire it, or had not known how to acquire it, 
or because the means to acquire it were not available to him. Now in reason, such a man has no grounds to reproach himself for inadequacy, yet he does so, telling himself that somehow he should know the things he does not know, and his self-esteem suffers accordingly. One of the worst wrongs a man can do to himself is to accept an unearned guilt on the premise of a somehow. Somehow I should know. Somehow I should be able to do it. This, when there is no cognitive content to that somehow, only an empty, undefined charge supported by nothing. There is one reason in particular why many men are susceptible to this error. Although a man may be blameless in the present situation, Previous irrationalities and failures to think may have led to a general sense of self-distrust, so that he never feels fully certain of his moral status. The solution to this problem lies in recognizing this form of uncertainty for what it is, identifying it as a symptom, and striving to be objective and factual in one's self-appraisal. The struggle to achieve a rational policy in dealing with guilt will in itself contribute to the regaining or strengthening of self-esteem. In analyzing the psychology of self-esteem, one of the most important aspects to consider is the relationship of self-esteem to productive work, and more broadly, to the growth and exercise of a man's mental abilities. When I discussed earlier the concept of efficacy, I was speaking of what might be called metaphysical efficacy. This is the kind of efficacy which pertains to a man's basic relationship to reality and reflects the reality-oriented nature of his thinking processes. But there is another sense in which the concept of efficacy may be used. It may refer to a man's effectiveness in specific areas of endeavor, resulting from particular knowledge and skills he has acquired. I shall designate this latter type as particularized efficacy. The kinds of particularized efficacy men acquire, the specific skills they attain, vary according to their interests, values, context, and knowledge. By contrast, metaphysical efficacy is not confined to any particular form of activity. It is applicable to every form of rational endeavor. Self-esteem is not a value which, once achieved, is maintained effortlessly and automatically thereafter. As in the case of every value of a living organism, action is necessary not only to gain it, but also to keep it. Just as the breathing a man does today will not keep him alive tomorrow, so the thinking a man does today will not preserve his self-esteem tomorrow, if he then chooses to evade, to stagnate mentally, to arrest and subvert his rational faculty. Man maintains his metaphysical efficacy by continuing to expand his particularized efficacy throughout his life, that is, by continuing to expand his knowledge, understanding, and ability. Continual intellectual growth is a necessity of self-esteem as it is a necessity of man's life. When man discovered how to make fire to keep himself warm, his need of thought and effort was not ended. When he discovered how to fashion a bow and arrow, his need of thought and effort was not ended. When he discovered how to build a shelter out of stone, then out of brick, then out of glass and steel, his need of thought and effort was not ended. When he moved his life expectancy from nineteen to thirty to forty to sixty to seventy, his need of thought and effort was not ended. So long as he lives, his need of thought and effort is never ended. The desire to grow in knowledge and skills, in understanding and control, is the expression of a man's commitment to the life process and to the state of being human. If and when a man decides that, in effect, he has thought enough, that no further learning is necessary, that he has nowhere to go and nothing to achieve, then he has decided, in fact, whether he recognizes it or not, that he has lived enough. Stagnant passivity and self-esteem are incompatible. The foregoing should not be taken to mean that for the psychologically healthy man, life consists exclusively of problem-solving, productive work, and the pursuit of long-range goals. No. Leisure, recreation, love, and human companionship 
are vital elements in human existence. But productive work is the process through which a man achieves that sense of control over his life which is the precondition of his being able fully to enjoy the other values possible to him. The man whose life lacks direction or purpose, the man who has no productive aim, necessarily feels helpless and out of control. The man who feels helpless and out of control feels inadequate to and unfit for existence. And the man who feels unfit for existence is incapable of enjoying it. A productive purpose is a psychological need. To live purposefully and productively is a requirement of psychological well-being. The earliest self-generated pleasure of a human being's life is the pleasure of gaining a sense of control, a sense of efficacy. As the child learns to move his body, to crawl, to bang a spoon against a table and produce a sound, to build a structure of blocks, the enjoyment he exhibits is that of a living being gaining power over its own existence. It is this form of pleasure that a psychologically healthy person never loses. It remains a central motive of his life. This attitude accounts for the phenomenon of the mentally active man who is young at 90, just as the absence of this attitude accounts for the phenomenon of the mentally passive man who is old at 30. Perhaps this is the place to remind you of what I said in the introduction, namely, that I use the term man here in the generic sense to apply equally to men and women. None of these observations are intended to apply exclusively to the male gender. The higher the level of a man's self-esteem, the higher the goals he sets for himself and the more demanding the challenges he tends to seek. On any level of intelligence or ability, one of the characteristics of self-esteem is a man's eagerness for the new and the challenging, for that which will allow him to use his capacities to the fullest extent. In the same way, a fondness for the familiar, the routine, the unexacting, and a fear of the new and the difficult is almost certainly an indication of a self-esteem deficiency. It must be emphasized that productive achievement is a consequence and an expression of healthy self-esteem, not its cause. The cause of authentic self-esteem is psychoepistemological, the rational, reality-directed character of a person's thinking processes. The causal sequence is as follows. A rational psychoepistemology leads to the attainment of self-esteem. The two together lead to achievements. Achievements lead to pride. Failing to understand this causal sequence, many men make the disastrous error of attempting to base their self-esteem on how well they succeed in achieving particular productive goals. However, success of this kind is not necessarily in a man's direct or exclusive control. Since man is neither omniscient nor infallible, and since in many productive endeavors the participation of other people is involved, it is profoundly dangerous to a person's self-esteem to let his sense of personal worth depend on factors beyond his control. The possession of self-esteem does not provide a man with automatic immunity to errors that may have painful emotional consequences. Rationality does not guarantee infallibility. But a healthy self-esteem gives man a great weapon in dealing with errors. Since his own value and the efficacy of his mind are not in doubt, he is free to bring his full intellectual powers and knowledge to the task of identifying facts and dealing with problems. The foundation of his consciousness is secure, so to speak. Conversely, one of the most disastrous consequences of an impaired or deficient self-esteem is that it tends to hamper and undercut the efficiency of a person's thinking processes. It deprives him of the full strength and benefit of his own intelligence. There are many ways in which a deficiency in self-esteem can adversely affect a person's thinking processes. If a man who faces the basic problems of life with an attitude of, who am I to know? Who am I to decide? The man is undercut intellectually at the outset. A mind does not struggle for that which it regards as impossible. If a man feels that his thinking is doomed to failure, he doesn't think, or doesn't think very persistently. If a man sees himself as helpless, ineffectual, his actions will tend to confirm and reinforce his negative self-image, thus setting up a vicious circle. By the same principle, a man who is confident of his efficacy will tend to function efficaciously. A man's self-appraisal has profound motivational consequences for good or for bad.
its most immediate impact is felt in the quality and ambitiousness of his thinking. Many men become, in effect, the psychological prisoners of their own negative self-image. They define themselves as weak or mediocre or unmasculine or cowardly or ineffectual, and their subsequent performance is affected accordingly. The process by which this occurs is subconscious. Most men do not hold their self-image in conscious, conceptual form. While men are capable of acting contrary to their negative self-image, and many men do so at least on some occasions, the factor that tends to prevent them from breaking free is their attitude of resignation toward their own state. This is a particularly tragic error. When a person suffers from low self-esteem and institutes various irrational defenses to protect himself from the knowledge of his deficiency, he necessarily introduces distortions into his thinking. Consider, for example, the case of a man who, lacking authentic self-esteem, attempts to gain a sense of personal value from the image of himself as a big operator in business, a daring and shrewd go-getter who is just one deal away from a fortune. He keeps losing money in one get-rich-quick scheme after another. He is always blind to the evidence that his plans are impractical, always boasting extravagantly, his eyes on nothing but the hypnotically dazzling image of himself as a brilliantly skillful businessman. In order to protect a view of himself that the facts of reality cannot sustain, he severs cognitive contact with reality. He moves from one disaster to another, his sight turned inward, dreading to discover that the vision of himself, which feels like a life preserver, is in fact a noose choking him to death. There is no way to preserve the clarity of one's thinking so long as there are considerations in one's mind that take precedence over the facts of reality. For tense, Self-deception, role-playing, are so much a part of most men's lives that they have virtually lost, if they ever possessed, the knowledge of what it means to have an unreserved respect for the facts of reality. That is, what it means to take reality seriously. They spend most of their lives in a subjective world of their own neurotic creation, then wonder why they feel anxiety and helplessness in the real world. The misery, frustration, and terror that characterize the psychological state of most men testify to two facts. First, that self-esteem is a basic need without which man cannot live the life proper to him. And second, that self-esteem can be achieved only by the consistent exercise of the one faculty that permits man to apprehend reality, his reason. Since self-esteem is a fundamental need of man's consciousness, Men who fail to achieve self-esteem strive to fake it. They try to evade its lack and to seek protection from their state of inner dread behind the barricade of a pseudo-self-esteem. Let me explain what pseudo-self-esteem means. It is a non-rational, self-protective device to diminish anxiety and to provide a spurious sense of security, a device to assuage a need of authentic self-esteem while allowing the real causes of its lack to be evaded. A person's pseudo-self-esteem is maintained by two means, essentially. First, by evading, repressing, rationalizing, and otherwise denying ideas and feelings that could affect his self-appraisal adversely. And second, by seeking to derive his sense of efficacy and worth from something other than rationality, some alternative value or virtue which he experiences as less demanding or more easily attainable. This might include such things as doing one's duty or being financially successful or sexually attractive. This complex process of self-deception on which the neurotic builds so much of his life holds the key to his motivation, to his values, and his goals. To understand the nature and form of a particular man's pseudo-self-esteem is to understand the mainspring of his actions, to know, in effect, what makes him tick. In the psychology of a man of authentic self-value, there is no clash between his recognition of the facts of reality and the preservation of his self-esteem. This is because he bases his self-esteem on his determination to know and to act in accordance with the facts of reality as he understands them. But to the man of pseudo-self-esteem, reality appears as a threat. He feels in effect that it's reality or his self-esteem. This is why a man may be perfectly rational and lucid in an area that does not touch on or threaten his pseudo-self-esteem and be flagrantly irrational, evasive, 
defensive, and even stupid in an area which is threatening to his self-appraisal. The process of evasion and repression is not sufficient to provide a neurotic with the illusion of self-esteem. That process is only part of the self-deception he perpetrates. The other part consists of the values he chooses as the means of achieving a sense of personal worth. In the process of choosing values, there is a fundamental difference in principle between the motivation of a man of self-esteem and a man of pseudo-self-esteem. An individual who develops healthily derives intense pleasure and pride from the work of his mind and from the achievements which that work makes possible. Feeling confident of his ability to deal with the facts of reality, he will want a challenging, effortful, creative existence. Feeling confident of his own value, he will be drawn to self-esteem in others. What he will desire most in human relationships is the opportunity to feel admiration. He will want to find persons and achievements he can respect that will give him the pleasure which his own character and achievements can offer others. In the sphere both of work and of human relationships, his base and motor is a firm sense of confidence, of efficacy, and as a consequence, a love for existence, for the fact of being alive. The base and motor of the man without self-esteem is not confidence, but fear. Not to live, but to escape his terror of life, is his fundamental goal. Not creativeness, but safety, is his ruling desire. And what he seeks from others is not the chance to experience admiration, but an escape from moral values, an escape from moral judgment, a promise to be forgiven, to be accepted, to be taken care of, to be comforted and protected in a terrifying universe. A man's self-esteem or pseudo-self-esteem determines his abstract values, not the specific goals he will seek. The latter proceed from a number of factors such as a person's intelligence, knowledge, premises, and personal context. For instance, a person of high self-esteem will desire intellectually challenging work, but whether he chooses to enter business or science or art depends on narrower, less fundamental considerations. Similarly, a man of pseudo-self-esteem will desire that others protect him from reality, but a variety of factors determine whether he feels more at home among the country club set or the academic set or the underworld set. The principle that distinguishes the basic motivation of a man of self-esteem from that of a man of pseudo-self-esteem is the principle of motivation by love versus motivation by fear. Love of self and of existence versus the fear that oneself is unfit for existence. Motivation by confidence versus motivation by terror. To the extent that a man lacks self-esteem, he lives negatively and defensively. When he chooses his particular values and goals, his primary motive is not to afford himself a positive enjoyment of existence, but to defend himself against anxiety, against painful feelings of inadequacy, self-doubt, and guilt. Values chosen in this manner may be termed defense values. A defense value is one motivated by fear and aimed at supporting a pseudo-self-esteem. It is experienced in effect as a means of survival, as a substitute for rationality. It is an anti-anxiety device. Such a value is unhealthy, not necessarily by virtue of its nature, but by virtue of the motivation for choosing it. The value itself may not be irrational. What is irrational is the reason for its selection. Productive work, for instance, is a rational value, but escaping into work as a means of evading one's shortcomings and conflicts is obviously not rational. A significant characteristic of defense values is the unreasoning compulsiveness with which they are usually held. Men of pseudo-self-esteem cling to these values with blind tenacity and fanatical devotion as they would cling to a life preserver in a stormy sea. Man's greatest fear is not of dying, but of feeling unfit to live. And to escape the agony of that feeling, men will pay any price. They will defy logic, they will sacrifice their practical self-interest, Sometimes they will even forfeit their life. With rare exceptions, they will pay any price except the one that could save them. They will not acknowledge the fraudulence of their defenses and work to achieve an authentic self-esteem. They will not accept the responsibility of living as rational beings. No evasion, no defense values, no strategy of self-deception can ever provide a man with a substitute for authentic self-esteem. The sense of efficacy and virtue men long for 
cannot be purchased by any of the self-frauds men perpetrate. Man needs the conviction that he is right for reality, right in principle, and only a policy of rationality can achieve it. The tragedy of most men's lives comes from their attempts to escape this fact. Self-esteem is the key to man's motivation, by virtue either of its presence or of its absence. And perhaps the most eloquent testimony to the urgency of man's need for self-esteem is the terror that haunts the lives of those who fail to achieve it, the twisted paths along which that terror drives them, and the inevitable wreckage at the end. There is no object of fear more terrifying to man than fear itself, and no fear more terrifying than that for which he knows no object. Yet to live with such fear as a haunting constant of their existence is the fate of countless millions of men and women. It has been the fate of most of the human race. I do not speak of that fear which few men can escape, the fear of dictatorship, of war, of enslavement, of economic collapse, of arbitrary, unpredictable violence. Such fear can be natural and rational, a realistically appropriate response to concrete and tangible dangers. The fear of which I speak occurs without the existence of any apparent perils. Its unique characteristic is that it appears to be causeless. Its victims know only that it has struck them, but they do not know why. Project the kind of terror a man would feel while hanging by a frayed rope over an abyss. Then omit the rope and the abyss. Conceive of a person victimized by such an emotion, not while suspended precariously in space, but while safely at home in his living room or at his office. This is pathological anxiety in its acute stage. Pathological anxiety is a state of dread experienced in the absence of any actual or impending objectively perceivable threat. Pathological anxiety differs from the ordinary fears of everyday life. Ordinary fear is a proportionate and localized reaction to a concrete, external, and immediate danger such as fear of standing in the path of an oncoming car. It differs also from normal anxiety. Normal anxiety is a feeling of helplessness and apprehension directed like fear toward a specific source, but the danger is less immediate than in the case of fear, and the emotion is more anticipatory, such as the feeling that might overcome a person confronted with signs of some serious illness. Normal fear and anxiety vanish when the danger is removed. They are not, in effect, a personality attribute of their possessor, but pathological anxiety is. Pathological anxiety does not always appear in an intense or violent form. Many of its victims know it not as an acute attack of panic or as a chronic sense of dread, but only as an occasional uneasiness, a diffuse sense of nervousness and apprehension, coming and going unpredictably, pursuing some incomprehensible pattern of its own. It can exist on a continuum from faint discomfort to an experience of such agony that many who have known it have sworn they would sooner die than undergo it a second time. In cases of pathological anxiety, the sufferer can give no identity to that which he fears, for he feels afraid of nothing in particular and of everything in general. If he tries to offer some rationalized explanation for his feeling, if he grasps at some sign in the external world to prove he is in danger, his explanations are transparently illogical. He then acts as though that which he fears is not any specific concrete, but reality as such. The percentage of people in the world who suffer from an acute form of mental or emotional disturbance is high. Yet such persons constitute only a very small percentage of the total number of men and women who suffer from pathological anxiety throughout most of their lives, but whose disorder never reaches an alarming degree. These individuals would, in most cases, be regarded by those around them as quite normal. They would not themselves think of questioning their psychological health merely because they are prey to fits of inexplicable, objectless apprehension. These are the persons who, for instance, cannot bear to be alone, or they cannot live without sleeping pills, or drink too much, or they feel a constant need to be amusing and entertain, or flee to too many movies they have no desire to see, and to too many gatherings they have no desire to attend. Or, these persons are obsessively concerned with what others think of them. Or, they long to be emotional dependents or to be dependent upon. Or, they succumb to periodic spells of unaccountable depression. Or, 
they run from one meaningless sexual affair to another. Or, they seek membership in the kind of collective movements that dissolve personal identity and obviate personal responsibility. A vast, anonymous assemblage of men and women who have accepted fear as a built-in, not-to-be-wondered-about fixture of their soul, dreading even to identify that what they feel is fear, or to inquire into the nature of that which they seek to escape.